Good afternoon, brethren. I'm speaking to you today from my home in Sheffield in Yorkshire, in the north of England. Those of you that are familiar with the history of QC Lodge will know that quite a lot of Masonic historians have lived in Sheffield over the years. Douglas Noop, <coughs> William Peretti Jones and Douglas Hamer, who produced early Masonic catechisms and early Masonic pamphlets, worked in the university here and lived here for most of their lives. David Flather, Dr John Stokes uh, and Joseph Ryle Clark were all Sheffield residents and indeed past masters of QC Lodge. Dr John Wade, the current editor of our transactions, AQC, lives in Sheffield and for a while our current master, Professor Andreas Unafosch, uh, lived in Sheffield while he was working at the university. I'm not going to read out my paper to you this afternoon. It is available online and is self-explanatory. Rather, I'm going to explain to you the origins of the paper and my purpose in writing it. Over a hundred years ago, in the pages of a popular Masonic journal of the time called the Freemason, an early member of this lodge, Brother Thomas Whitehead, <coughs> called upon the members of the lodge and of its correspondent circle to probe every imaginable crevice, he wrote, we may, that we may extract some ray of light to illumine the present clouded condition of the sources of our ancient history. Well, I'm afraid, brethren, the uh, condition is still clouded, 140 years later. Uh, in particular, Brother Whitehead wanted his brethren to look into the origins of the third degree and of the Hiramic legend. And if you look at the uh, collected indexes of AQC, <clears throat> you will be quite surprised that um, relatively little has been written on the subject in spite of the popularity of the third degree, which is, I suppose, our most popular ceremony. When Anderson published his Constitutions in 1723, it contained the regulations written by George Payne and approved by the Grand Lodge in 1721. And one of those regulations states, and, and I quote it to you, No brother can be a warden until he has passed the part of a fellow craft, nor a master until he has acted as a warden. <coughs> In other words, brethren, he is saying that um, in order to be the master of a lodge, you had to be in Masonic rank a fellow craft. Well, of course, at this time, when the Grand Lodge was founded in 1717 and still in 1723, the most senior Masonic rank was that of a fellow craft. There were just simply two degrees, entered apprentice and fellow craft, and that had been the situation going right the way back with the operative Masons. But if we move on to Anderson's second book of constitutions, published in 1738, that regulation has changed. And what it says is, <clears throat> the wardens are chosen from among the master masons, and no brother can be a master of a lodge till he has acted as a warden somewhere. So between 1723 and 1738, a period of 15 years. The requirement for him to be master of a lodge had changed from being a fellow craft to being a master mason, to have been raised in the third degree. Now that's quite a big change in 15 years, because it means not only that the third degree was being worked, it also means that the third degree was the norm and after all, at that time, 1738, there were around 150 lodges um, warranted by the Grand Lodge, <clears throat> all of whom would have been working the third degree in order that uh, their brethren could proceed to, the, to, to be a master of their lodge. And midway between 
1723 and 1738, uh, in 1730, we have the first published description of the third degree in Matthew Pritchard's famous expose, uh, Masonry Dissected. In a way, <clears throat> Anderson's Constitution, two volumes, sort of frame our picture, as a way. This is the sort of period that we are looking at. And during that period, of course, Freemasonry became extremely popular. From the so-called four old lodges that formed the Grand Lodge in 1717, by 1723 there are about 50 lodges in London and Westminster. And if we move on to 1737-38, as I say, we're talking about 150 lodges. And there's no doubt that the third degree was very popular right from the start. Now, my aim in this paper has been to draw together <clears throat> all the primary source material that relates, however obliquely, to the creation of the third degree and of its associated Hiramic legend. Secondly, my purpose has been obviously to suggest an interpretation of that material. And as you will see from the title of my paper, I argue that the creator of the Hiramic legend and of the third degree, and indeed <clears throat> of the degree associated with, with it, the degree of Scots master, was our third Grand Master, Dr. John Théophile Desaguliers. And if you want to know about him, and he was the most dominant figure in English masonry um, for the 30 years from the um, about 17, 17, well, certainly 1716, right through to his death in 1744, I recommend that you get a copy of um, Audrey Carpenter's book on him. It's, it's a superb book, and the, one of the chapters is devoted to what he did in Freemasonry. But it also gives you a good idea of his whole life, which was spent as a lecturer on science, and indeed a, a world-famous lecturer on science. <clears throat> Not all the material in the third degree, of course, is new. The raising on the five points of fellowship, for example, was much, much older than the degree itself, and was originally part of the fellow craft degree. Um, our earliest record of the, raise, the raising on the five points, uh, and sometimes there were six and sometimes other uh, numbers in, in some of the early documents, but the earliest one is the Edinburgh Reg Register House manuscript of 1696. But the raising is, is much older than that, and is part of that group that we might call the working tools, namely uh, things that were moralised upon, and the Five points is clearly the moralising of a procedure of actually raising, literally, um, uh, someone who had fallen from scaffolding and doing it as, as safely as one can and not causing more damage to the individual. It, it's, a, if you like, a bit of health and safety, we would call it now. And interestingly enough, uh, a mason that I know quite well, who's a former fireman, tells me that what we do in the raising ceremony is not terribly different from what a, a fireman actually does if somebody is, uh, is on the ground now, in order to raise them safely. I also argue in my paper that there was a very close relationship between the third degree and what we now call the Royal Arch. Now, of course, in those days, um, there was no Royal Arch degree. <clears throat> but the degree from which the Royal Arch developed was the degree of Scots Master. Now, there is a difference between the degree of Scots Master and the Supreme Order. And that difference is not in the story, but actually in uh, the fact that the, the lodge is, is different. Um, the the, um, the Scots Master degree, for example, you know, was a traditional lodge. It had a Scots Master, it had a Scots Senior Warden and a Scots Junior Warden. Now, as we all know, in the <clears throat> Royal Arch, we have a unique situation of three 
co-equal masters called principles. Now, that had evolved by the 1760s. We've got written records in York in 1762 and in London in 1765 and 1766. That is to say of uh, three co-equal principles and the two scribes and the three sojourners and so on. But what existed in the 1730s and 40s and was being worked in London and indeed in the provinces, uh, we know in certainly in Bristol and Bath and Salisbury, uh, was the degree of Scots Master, which did contain the story that is told by the Sojourners in the Royal Arch, namely the discovery of the lost word in the crypt, in the original story, actually in a cave, but under Solomon's Temple. <clears throat> But this is a key point in this, I think, because this story was discovered by Des Aguliers in a copy of Samuel Lee's Orbis Miraculum, a book published in 16, 1659. Um, and I think Des Aguliers just simply saw that it would make a wonderful Masonic ceremony. But you can't use the story of the rediscovery of the word until you've accounted for its loss. And that is my argument that this was what lay behind the creation of the Hiramic legend, which, as you know, describes the loss of the word and of how Hiram, you know, was faithful to his obligations. It is, an, you know, an allegory of, of, the, of the biblical passage, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee the crown of life. And as we know in the ceremony, uh, when uh, Hiram, after he's killed, he's raised, and he indeed receives the crown of life. But of course, at the end of the third degree ceremony, the candidate is given substituted secrets. The word has been lost. But he receives the genuine secret of a master mason. No, brethren of a master mason not of the Royal Arch, in what we now call the Royal Arch degree. And there is a very close association between those degrees, and has been, I argue, right from the word go, from the start. Whether you call the, the, uh, the Royal Arch a degree or not is, is irrelevant. The fact it is most certain that it is the second part of the third degree. It is the completion of the third degree. <clears throat> Our Book of Constitution states that the Royal Arch is part of the third degree, and that is absolutely correct. It's correct historically, it is correct ritually, and it is correct structurally. As I say, the candidate receives the genuine secret of a master mason in the Royal Arch or in the early days in the degree of Scots Master. And we know this, incidentally, uh, because of what um, John Custos tells, or rather told, the Inquisition in the 1740s uh, in Lisbon. Now, the third uh, aspect of my paper was to appeal to really all the members of the Lodge and the Correspondent Circle and all Masons who are interested in the history of this period to look for more primary source material. If one is writing a dissertation on a, for a high degree, <clears throat> the first job is always the same. It is to provide a resume of what is known so far before you start uh, doing your own original research. And what I provided in my paper is in sense partly that uh, I've put uh, hopefully all in one place the information that we know at the moment, the primary source material that we know at the moment, so that if any Mason thinks they've made a discovery or that it's something's new, they can at least go to one place, and that will be AQC 134, and they will be able to look and they will be able to see whether it is something new or isn't something new. Uh, I'm quite often uh, uh, contacted by Masons who think they've made a great discovery and I'm very sorry that, that most of the time I have to uh, tell them that, uh, that they haven't. Um, and very often, in fact, uh, what they need to go and look at are the early volumes of AQC and 
Can I just remind you, brethren, that these are on the website and they're online and they're free and they really contain, you know, a mass of wonderful research and information. You will remember the uh, famous phrase wrongly attributed to Sir Isaac Newton that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, our early members of this lodge were certainly giants in terms of uh, Masonic history and I do commend to you uh, reading those early volumes which, as I say, are free online on, on the website. They contain real treasure. Now, if you're looking for material, I, perhaps I can suggest a few places you might look. Um, minutes of Lodges is obviously a very good place to look, and it is really surprising, brethren, how few copies of early private Lodge uh, minutes are extant. Now, in 1721, George Payne, in his regulations, made it clear that lodges should uh, have a secretary and keep records, and a treasurer and keep account. And the Grand Lodge did exactly that. It was obeying its own rules. It, it appointed, you know, William Cooper as its first secretary and Blackaby as its treasurer. And we have the minutes of the Grand Lodge complete from 1723. Now, by 1738, there were 150 lodges, all of, all of which would have been keeping minutes and accounts. And yet, all that is extant at the moment, or known about at the moment, is literally a handful of these minutes. Even famous old lodges, like uh, Lodge 4, the lodge of the Royal Somerset House and Inverness Lodge, which uh, originates with the lodge at the uh, Horn, uh, the Horn Tavern in uh, New Palace Yard. Uh, their early minutes only go back to 1783, so there are at least about 70-odd years of lost minutes there. Um, there must be more around. I mean, if there were 150 sets in 1738, yes, many will be lost, many will have been destroyed, but there must be more than the handful that we know about at the moment. And whatever they say, however brief, is going to be very important, because of the rarity. <clears throat> Newspaper is another very good place to look. Now everybody knows about the Burney collection in the British Library and most people seem to think it is complete. Well I can tell you brethren it's not. It, it, it only contains about half the published papers of the time. It's online. It's available. It's been researched to death, brethren, for the last hundred years, and it is very unlikely that you're going to find anything new there. Um, but there are collections of newspapers in public libraries and in university libraries and in major copyright libraries. Um, many of them have not been catalogued and certainly not digitised. Now, one of the most useful inaugural lectures in QC Lodge was given in 1945 by Brother Johnson. And what he did is he published his own personal collection of extracts from local newspapers, provincial newspapers, for the area in which he lived, which is where I'm speaking to you now, in, from Yorkshire. <coughs> and it uh, has the title, it's in the AQC, of course, um, 1945 is the year, and uh, it is a sort of the Masonic references in early provincial papers in the northeast of England up to 1751. Extremely useful, because although the provincial newspapers very often just copy what was in the London papers, of course, if the provincial paper is extant and the London paper is lost, of course, that's the only record we have. And also, and I've had this uh, happen to me, the provincial paper sometimes added a little bit of extra information. Um, I had a case, for example, the London paper gave a person's name. The provincial copy just added one sentence, which simply said, the author of a couple of books, which meant I could pinpoint that individual to precisely one person, not just anyone with that particular name. Would that others had actually followed uh, Brother Johnson's uh, example and catalogued and searched the papers just for their own area. It would be frightfully useful. And I know I can speak for the editor of AQC. He would be delighted to publish this information because it is so useful to everybody and so important. Let's not forget letters and diaries, brethren, either. 
a great deal has been come out of, for example, the letters of um, the second Duke of Richmond. He wrote to his friend, President Montesquieu. Uh, he wrote to his friend, uh, Martin Fox, the President of the Royal Society. And there's quite a lot of Masonic information in those letters. And I'm sure there are letters between other Masons who, uh, which contain uh, information that would be useful to us from this particular period and perhaps has not been recognised unless the person reading the letters or editing the letters or publishing the letters actually is a Freemason and understands the Masonic references that might be there. And lastly, brethren, let me remind you, let's not forget artefacts, which can be very interesting. Uh, to give you uh, an example, Desaguliers, one of his many uh, innovations in masonry, because he changed the design of lodges, he was involved in creating the Grand Charity, he revived the Office of Stewards. Um, he also created floor cloths, which are the precursor, of course, of our tracing boards. Now, the earliest one of those that I know about dates from 1741-42, and it was carried like a banner in a procession. And it's quite interesting because if you look at it closely, you will see it contains the working tools of both the first and the second degree. And this confirms what we read in other places, that the first and second degrees was very often worked together in the same ceremony and by the early speculative masons. For example, Des Aguliers himself, when he initiated the Duke of Lorraine in The Hague in 1731, he not only initiated him, he passed him at the same, at the same ceremony. And so this artefact, this floor cloth, shows that this was used for that sort of ceremony, because as you know now, we wouldn't show the working tools of the fellow craft uh, to an entered apprentice. But if you're doing both, if you have a a floor cloth which contains both sets of tools, clearly it was used at a ceremony at which both degrees were being worked. Anyhow, brethren, um, you get my point, I'm sure. Now, you might say to me, well, you know, are we ever going to make a discovery? Well, let me give you an example just to show you how these things do occur. In uh, 1716, I was uh, looking for a particular letter that had been written by uh, the second Duke of Richmond to Martin Fox that I referred to earlier, the President of the Royal Society. They corresponded quite a lot and Martin Fox kept the letters together and he tied them all up with a bit of ribbon and he put them in his library. And they laid in his library uh, for 200 years until one of his uh, descendants at the beginning of the 20th century decided to sell them. Um, she sent them to a London uh, auction house, they sold them to a mason, the mason put them in a deed box in the bank. When he died, um, nobody knew he got this deed box. Uh, his brother had died, who was his executor, his wife had died also, and there were no children. So the deed box just lay in the bank. Now, in the 20th century, in about uh, 2010, uh, the banks decided they were no longer going to offer this facility to their customers. So they wrote to everyone who had got uh, a box um, and asked them to clear their boxes. Now, inevitably, with cases like this, where the people had died, um, they had no reply and they ended up, the bank ended up with a number of boxes uh, that were unclaimed. So they opened them. And in this particular box, they found this pile of letters tied together in ribbon. And they saw that they were addressed to Martin Fox, and they knew from you know looking up on Wikipedia or wherever you like that Martin Fox was president of the Royal Society, so they sent them to the Royal Society Library, very sensible. Uh, I went there to look for a particular letter that I knew would be in this pile. The librarian kindly brought the pile of letters, I undid the ribbon, and out fell the earliest engraved list of lodges published in the same month as Anderson's Constitutions, March 1723. Now Lane, who was the authority on, uh, on these and had written a very good book, uh, which you may have, um, on the early lists of lodges, had surmised that there was a lost original. He was right. 
He was absolutely right. And there it was, lying in front of me, just fallen out of a pile of letters, where it had lain for about 300 years. So yes, brethren, you can make discoveries. But it's important that when the discovery is made that you actually recognise that it is a discovery. If I'd not known what it was, I might have just poked it back in that pile of letters, you know, tied up the ribbon and it might have lain there for another century. But your discoveries happen, brethren, and there are many discoveries to be made, more in actually the history of Freemasonry than in other er any other area I know. And who knows, brethren, um, like the sojourns of old, one day you too might say, uh, it is found. And I can tell you, brethren, nobody would be more pleased or more delighted than me. Thank you, brethren, for your attention.